Welcome to the October 19th meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. First piece of business is discussion and approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. What is the board's desire? Second. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Steve. It has been moved and seconded that the minutes of the previous meeting be approved. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It is unanimous. The correspondence received both on the podium this evening and with our meeting packets delivered to our homes from Town Council Michael Hill. In regards to DeMille et al. versus the town of Cape Elizabeth et al., this is an ongoing civil action uh, involving the town, the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. Shoreland Zoning News Newsletter, summer of 1999. A letter from Linda and Everett Johnson of 1235 Shore Road in regards to the Scout House restaurant application. A letter from TJM Consulting, Food Service Consultant, in regards to the <coughs> Scout House Restaurant Project. A letter from Mary Ellen and David Whitenen, in regards to the application of the Shore House, uh, Scout House Restaurant. A letter from Jonesy's Service Center, from Greg Jones, in regards to the Scout House property application. A letter from Alan Atkins in regards to the Scout House restaurant application. A copy of a newspaper article from the American Journal, October 13th, 1999, uh, reporting on a Cape Elizabeth Planning Board workshop meeting and the new sidewalks and street lights in the town center zone. A letter from Leland and Carol Murray in regards to the Scout House restaurant application. A letter from Mary Townsend, Steve Notice, Deborah Curtis, John Donnelly, in regards to the Scout House restaurant application. A letter from Colleen Myers in regards to the Scout House restaurant application. Two letters from Michael Hill, the town council in regards to the Scout House restaurant application. I'm going to pause for just a moment in regards to these two pieces of correspondence from Michael Hill and ask that Maureen take a minute to explain specifically the second one that was just received tonight for the benefit of board members. I just wanted to point out for the board the uh, letter from the town attorney dated today, October 19th. Um, the reason I wanted to call your attention to it is on the second page, he has drafted two findings of fact, which you can use or you cannot use as you see fit, but I just wanted to call your attention to them that they are there in case someone wants to make a motion and use those findings. Thank you. Any questions of Maureen before I continue on? I'd like to thank the public that's here this evening for giving us that extra time to review their correspondence. Much of it concerned an application that is before us this evening, and I wanted a chance to read it before we continued on. Under old business, the only item on the agenda this evening is the Shore Road Restaurant Site Plan. If the applicant could come forward, please, and reintroduce themselves. Good evening. And if you could just bring us up to date since our last meeting, please. Once again, my name is Helen Muther. I'm a principal in 1231 Associates, the applicant for the Scout House Restaurant Project. I thought it would be helpful tonight to go over the modifications to the application which we have made since the last hearing. Uh, first of all, the site plan has been revised based on Mr. Emery's comments and others from the board and the public. We now show th such things as the trees which will be removed, the um, added dimensional layouts of the walkways and deck, uh, the grease trap information, setbacks, etc. Regarding odor, 
As we said before, it's not a criteria of site plan review based on our review of the ordinance. However, we did include in our application um, amendment a detail of the type of hood and fan that would be used in the restaurant. Also, we asked our kitchen consultant, TGM, which is the letter that you referred to tonight, to write and explain the hood system. As you can see in the letter, he states that the hood system extracts up to 95% of the grease um, coming um, out of the facility and thereby eliminating un undesirable odors. Another detail shows the path for delivery trucks on the uh, site. As you can see from that detail, there's plenty of room for trucks to back up and maneuver in the site without having to back up onto Shore Road. I would add that we don't anticipate numerous large trucks coming in. What we see more as the AG, AG Kennedy type produce local vans that would be delivering to the restaurant. Regarding buffering, We've added a the fence along the entire east side, along in here. That fence, as you see from the details, um, excuse me, from the site plan, is eight feet in height and cedar, and what it will do is match the existing fence, which has been put up by the abutter on their property. As you may recall, this is the abutter's right of way. On the northerly side, you'll see there's a detail in the amendment to the application, which shows the expanded 42-inch high wood guardrail. And it shows the various heights of the headlights of various different vehicles, with the highest one being the Ford F-150, which it, its headlights come up to 37 inches. Therefore, the guardrail um, effectively blocking the headlights. We feel that with this full guardrail, expanded height, the Ragoza, and the extensive trees between this site and more than 250 feet back to the nearest northerly abutter, will um, it'll be highly unlikely that there'll be any highlight headlight wash, and therefore an effective buffer. Our greatest challenge has been addressing the westerly side, side abutters, the Johnsons. We have tried to listen to their concerns. We have tried to read their letters carefully. We understand that their issues included such things as people parking on their property and buffering between the properties, although uh, they are having to use our driveway for their access. We looked at their lawyer's letter, who, which stated that the ordinance, quote unquote, seems to require a buffer of earth berms and wood fences. So what we did is talk to our technical design people and our landscape consultant, and they came up with a slight modification. You'll see now that the driveway is actually moved over a few feet, retaining the required setbacks, retaining the required room, but giving us on our property some additional footage to have a buffer. What we've proposed for that, and there are details again in our application, is a cedar fence of varying heights to give some kind of aesthetic interest to the, prop, to the buffer, as well as augmented by plantings. This is a difficult decision for us because it's going to cost, we got estimates of over $3,000 just to put up that fence and the plantings. But once again, we, we, we're trying to do whatever we can to help differentiate those two properties and provide some form of buffering. Similarly, we increased the berm. So now this comes down farther than it did before, again, emphasizing the difference between the two properties. This is still uh, approximately 20 feet wide, and a f the sign will be right on the end here, which shows that restaurant parking will be on this side. <coughs> Finally, there was a lot of talk about size of this project. We wanted to remind the board, as I know you know, that this is a permitted use. In fact, I went back again, because this has been going on now for so long, to look at the permitted uses and was reminded that the town center district was just as clearly within. There's retail shops could be built here, a veterinary clinic, a medical clinic, gas stations, repair garages, daycare centers, even a school could be allowed here. In fact, we could have torn down the entire building and, put, and proposed a whole new building. We could have built a two-story building, arguably, which would be in harmony with the neighborhood because of our abutter has a very high two-story building. 
Instead, what we did is we significantly reduced it. We retained as much of the facade as is constructively possible, retained the footprint with only a minor addition to that footprint, kept it single story, limited the seating to what we're drawing is about 10 tables, which is about 40 people, limited the parking to 15 spaces, coming up with a square footage of nearly 2,072 square feet. In comparison, we have a variety of commercial properties in the direct vicinity, which all cover significantly more of their site. In the whole area of this whole general vicinity, we have a mixed use that this clearly fits within. We've got the bank across the street. We've got the dentist across the street. We have excavation. We have gas stations. We've got the library. You have the uh, consignment shop. You have the convenience stores, a grocery store, professional offices. In fact, the commercial properties, the excavation, the dentist, the real estate office, and Jonesy's have all written in support of the project. The Johnsons, as you know, back in 92, went before his board for an expansion of their property. For their mixed use of office, residential tenants, and residents. In fact, in 1999, this board, in the spring of 99, approved revisions to that plan. On their plan, it's 60% impervious for that whole area. The Scout House is 51% impervious. On their plan, they have 15 parking spaces and additional parking within their garage. The Scout House only has the 15. Their office space alone, is, with the residential tenants, is over 2,400 feet, square feet, larger than the Scout House. And on top of that, their residence is 3,000 400 square feet, plus or a little bit more. It's clearly their mixed use next door neighbor is much bigger in size and scope, yet they still need to use our driveway to get into their property. I make these, this whole long list just to once again conclude, to show what we feel that we've tried everything and that we have made a significant and at great cost modifications in listening to all the butters and fitting into the town center plan. We know that we've now been here for four months. That's not a record for this planning board. But we think at this point, we've done everything that we can to show that we've met all the town center and site plan criteria. We've minimized adverse impacts on the adjacent properties, as is clearly shown by everything that we've submitted. We're now here. I have Terry and Jim both here again tonight to answer any additional questions. And we'd ask that at the end of this meeting that you approve our site plan application. Thank you. Thank you. This time this application is now open for discussion by planning board members. Deciding who wants to go first, Maureen, is there anything you wish to add? Oh, no. Okay. Board members? I'll go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. Um, a couple of questions looking at first at sheet two. Uh, the trees that are remain are, are noted on this, on the landscape plan. <clears throat> is that, if, if I'm the contractor, is that the plan I go to? to understand which trees that are remain and which ones are to be removed? Yes, I can answer that. Jim Fisher from uh, Delorier and Associates, surveyors and engineers in this project. Uh, the trees that you see on there, are, uh, both of them are uh, of both types, I should say, those mm -hmm. that are going to be remaining and those that are uh, supposed to be cut, you can see on that plan. Those okay. are the area that uh, are, in which you can tell is the area of the parking area, the parking lot, um, are grayed slightly, and they are also marked with a, uh, a separate uh, symbol. Um, there's a 10-inch uh, oak to the uh, just to the right of the front of the building, uh, and it shows up on that plan. There's a proposed sewer line that's going very close to that oak. <laughs> Is that line going to be jacked underneath the tree, or what's the proposal to protect? Sorry, the what line? There's a sewer line, a house service, <laughs> going past that tree, and I think it's very close to the uh, trunk of the tree. 
Yes, that's correct. Is that is that going to be excavated, uh, or is that going to be uh, something other? Is that going to be jacked through there, or is it going to be excavated through the roots? It's going to be excavated uh, to the extent that we can put it by a code in order to keep that line very enough. Uh, but we're going to be all possible attempts are to uh, keep that tree alive. <coughs> Uh, we want to make sure that we maintain as much of the aesthetic atmosphere as possible. And it, with an oak tree, it is doable as far as that's concerned, by like, you know, getting around and underneath those roots. It's not an absolute guarantee. We don't know that until we actually keep in digging. Okay. The tree is proposed to stay there. I, I guess what I, for the my butter's <coughs> sake and for the planning board's <coughs> purposes, if there's, for whatever reason, there are oaks indicated on here that, particularly this one I'm thinking of, and I think it would be appropriate that the, uh, abu- that the applicant replace that tree with something in the neighborhood of a four-inch caliper uh, tree of similar species. You mean if the tree, if we ended up having to uh, remove it? That's correct. <laughs> I don't think that would be a problem at all. I don't think no. that can be true throughout because a four-inch caliper tree is nothing compared to the mature trees that are on the site. This one fairly tight to the building. Um, there are several... Uh, white pines in the back right-hand corner of the, of the parcel that are located beneath uh, fairly large oak trees. And I'm not sure those are going to do well in terms of creating a buffer, um, something more like a, perhaps Canadian hemlock or an arborvitae or something that generally grows better in less sunlight might be appropriate there, but I'll leave that up to your... The size of the tree is fine. It's five to six feet. Um, I like the fence. What we didn't get with the fence is we didn't get a detailed design. We got a, a sketch plan. I uh, have that for you. Excuse me? We have that for you. Okay. Um, I like what you've done with it, and uh, I think that's a, a reasonable attempt to try to work within the property limits that you have and to address the concerns of the neighbor in terms of views from the, from the porch. Um, excuse me, but would it be appropriate to pass that out now, the um, design? We like to have everything pass through Maureen's office first, yeah. just to just so it becomes a matter of the public record, and I would distributed to us. To pin it to the. Um, if you wish board. to put it up on the bulletin board, go right ahead, and uh, perhaps Tom can ask you questions. Yes. What what they have, and I haven't seen it, but um, they were the rendering of the fence, and uh, our town engineer had requested a detail that was drawn to scale, and they have prepared it. I haven't seen it, but they, they, that's what they want to distribute yeah. this evening, or we can submit it at a later date. It's, it's supposed to be a more detailed version of what you have there, Mark. Uh, just a couple of other comments. Under the uh, tree protection uh, detail, uh, that detail is meant, I think, to protect the bark of the tree, but it doesn't do anything to protect the root zone of the tree. And it looks like you're going to have an awful lot of equipment and, and construction going on here, so I would recommend that something uh, snow fence be placed at a wider diameter from the trunk. Um, typically it's the drip line, but certainly something 10 feet out from the trunk would be more appropriate than tight to the trunk. Uh, and on the plant list, you have uh, quite an extensive uh, cottage garden in front of the building and several perennial gardens, and there's a uh, list of perennial understory mixture, uh, and unless I'm missing something, I don't see the square footage is listed in a, in a number of different plants, but there's no spacing or number of plants. Either one would be acceptable. Um, I know there's a certain amount of creativity that goes into selecting which perennials go where, and, and that's quite a detail. But I think in the town's interest and the abutter's interest, either provide a spacing that the, these would be typically placed at whatever it might be on center or that give us a number uh, for them. We can certainly do that as a condition of approval if you're looking for a specific number or uh, for spacing as far as that's concerned. A fairly uh, detailed issue, but one that uh, we always get hung up on in terms of trying to protect existing trees is, as an example, on drawing, uh, on the site plan drawing, uh, sheet one. And I thank you. This is much more legible. This is uh, exactly what I was looking for. Um, On the island, uh, just to the north of the uh, five parking spaces, there's a 
an existing 20 inch oak in that island. And it, and it appears that that island <coughs> now is at elevation 111. And it appears as though the grading, the proposed grading, is changing that. Yes, we're actually going to be adding approximately six inches of topsoil across that, uh, uh, the entire site, or the entire site that is uh, pervious. Uh, and a portion of that island, which is obviously a part of the pervious surface, is uh, going to be raised somewhat. It's, I, it's just important for the contractor to know that that the uh, that grade has to be very close to what it is now, or the or the root system will be damaged on that oak, Absolutely. and it won't survive. And that's true of any place you're showing existing oaks. Um, and the and the real spot check on that, and Terry well knows, is that if you've done in the survey, normally these are given as points and the points of elevations. If you look at those point elevations for each one of those trees and look at the grading plan, just be sure that. The proposed grade, spot grade in that area matches somewhat close to what the uh, existing elevation is. Absolutely. What's going to determine what happens out front with respect to the stone wall fence um, or hedge? You have a note on the It'll plan that gives It'll, us. We just we don't know at this point both for costs and aesthetics which may, which what makes the most sense, which is why we've left it open. There's no height <coughs> given for the, the the fence. Should should we say that it's whatever height it is? Uh, four feet might be a little tall. <laughs> I don't want to micro design this. Yeah, thing, that's part of the problem, and also because of the setback, it's so close to the road. It's hard to determine at this point um, what will both make sense for height. And Okay. Terry has a great idea. Terry DeWine, Lights of the Market. That is a design detail. Um, the fence itself, if it is a fence, probably would be 36 inches high. Mm -hmm. The stone wall probably designed in conjunction with the cottage garden. And our, our concept is if you're inside, you should be able to look out to the, the cottage garden. And you'd see plant material that may range up to four feet in height. So we're, when you're inside, you're looking out and really focusing on. The, the colors and the greenery, and really not aware of the, uh, the traffic going by mm -hmm. in the background. So I guess we'd like to be somewhat flexible at this point. I just you know, wanted to be sure it wasn't a six foot high or a five foot high picket fence. Yeah, or a six inch high. Yeah. Flexibility is something that is a little difficult for code enforcement officers, and, and uh, you know, three months down the road when this thing's built and. The plan always comes out inevitably. The plan comes out, and if it wasn't on the plans, then the code enforcement officer uh, has a difficult issue in, in the planner in terms of enforcing the, uh, uh, the, the plan. Uh, one other question I had, I, I think a couple of uh, meetings ago, was this issue on the location of the uh, grease trap. Uh, it's a concrete vault outside the building located fairly close to the property line, four and a half feet. Um, for the record, is, has that been answered, Maureen, as to whether there's any issue with that location? Yes. I spoke to the code officer and asked him about it. There is no specific setback. However, because it's uh, under the plumbing code, it has to be a minimum of four feet off of the property line. And I believe that the applicants, uh, I informed them of this, and they made a redesign. Okay. Good. <clears throat> Uh, the only other uh, issue I might raise is this issue of the guardrail, and I saw the section and all that. Uh, we have a note in our pack in our, on the table this evening, and I think it, even though it may not have been uh, provided in writing in, in the past, I think it certainly the issue was expressed at the past public hearing, and that's the issue of the effectiveness of the screening of that parking lot. And there's uh, concern raised now that if we were to look at it during the fall or winter, we would have a different impression than what we might have when all the trees are in leaf. And uh, I don't question that you've done um, a thorough job in trying to deal with that issue and to uh, show the planning board how that's going to be dealt with. I'm wondering, uh, for the sake of time and for the concern of the abutters, is, if it's appropriate that um, to put, it, put into this, uh, uh, if there is an approval of this, that one row of these Rosa Rugosas might be replaced by a taller growing evergreen uh, shrub or, or small tree, again like a, uh, 
an arborvitae or something like that in the event that the um, guardrail is inadequate for screening the parking, I mean the uh, headlights. Terry, I'll check with Terry in terms of the type of uh, screening. My only problem with that is the, um, from experience I've had in the past of leaving something open like that because um, my concern is that um, the abutter at some point might have some concerns and say, I can still see the headlight wash. We may not agree, but nonetheless, if they say that, we put in some trees, that's not enough, and it goes on and on and on. And that's, that's my concern with mm -hmm. leaving it at, at, at that open. Um, Terry, do you have some comment on if you think those are the appropriate plans? I guess I'd, I'd like to have some discussion what the appropriate standard is to judge what is an inappropriate amount of ability to see headlight. You know, looking 250 feet through an oak woods, going through solid wood like this, doesn't to me sound like there's going to be an awful lot of headlight wash. Um, I guess my answer to that is now that it's, it's black there now. Um, and that the, the impact, potential impact of the headlight glowing above and below the, uh, uh, the proposed guardrail. Um, the other issue that was discussed is the possibility of putting a fence in that location. Uh, well, we're actually putting a fence. Now, this is going to be a solid piece of wood there. 36 inches high, is it? 42 inches high. It's a double height guardrail for yeah, the, yeah, so, so the public understands. Yeah, that's up yeah. To this high. Okay. It's effectively a fence because yeah. of the height yeah. of the car fence. Yeah, a higher fence is not going to do anything more to block the headlights. Right. I'm thinking of Navigator 2000. <laughs> yeah, the urban assault vehicle. <laughs> Uh, the, I guess my last comment would be with respect to the impact in terms of the times of use. Uh, the, we've had, uh, we understand, we have a member of the board who, who deals with mechanical systems and may be a mechanical engineer, I'm not sure, but we understand the complexity of dealing with food odors and we understand, or at least I understand, the issue of grease uh, cooking versus uh, a finer type of cooking, for lack of any proper terminology. Um, but the, the greatest impact that I perceive here is the possibility of a restaurant that might be open until 11, and my understanding is that if the patrons leave the restaurant at 11, the uh, staff are still there for an hour or more doing dishes and cleaning up and getting ready for the breakfast uh, uh, shift coming in. And that would put this, this restaurant open until midnight and perhaps as late as 1 o'clock uh, between <laughs> What, what is uh, a residence on the right, a residence to the rear, and a mixed use on the left. Um, and uh, we, I don't, I can't judge the impact of that now. I just, I, I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's going to be, um, it, it all has to do a lot with the management of the, <clears throat> of the property and of the facility, in my opinion, and the type of, um, if this were just literally a pub or something and, and uh, became a pool hall, that would be something else, but that's not what we're, we're listening to tonight. <clears throat> that's not what's been proposed. Um, I don't know, Maureen, if in the, in the past, if planning boards have dealt with this issue, if they've revisited the issue, and I know the, the applicant will leap right out of the chair when I say this, but if they've dealt with this issue um, by a contingency that uh, we'll see how the operation is working after 12 months and at 12 months. We, we essentially do that with, our, uh, uh, with the uh, gravel, not the gravel, but the rock quarry in town, that the rock quarry uh, has, a, it has a permit to operate, but it comes back to the board on an annual basis uh, just to be sure that they're operating within their, their permit conditions. Um, I don't know if something like that's appropriate. It's... <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, Maureen. Um, there, there are two ways to address that. Uh, in my opinion, the first way is to uh, require that this project be uh, subject to the performance guarantee requirements so that uh, at least you have a, a monetary guarantee that the code officer will not be issuing a certificate of occupancy until everything that has been approved on the plan has actually been constructed according to the plan. Mm -hmm. Um, and that the applicant post a guarantee and that their funds not be released until all of that work has been done. 
Uh, the only other uh, time I have seen this board uh, attach a condition that was, uh, let's go back in a year and see what it looks like, was uh, a lighting condition. And in fact, uh, the plan was approved, the lights were installed, uh, there was a general, I guess, community consensus that the lights were too bright, and they never came back a year later. They re readjusted the lights on their own within two months. Okay. So um, it's uh, all I would suggest is if, if you want a revisiting of certain issues, um, that you need to be fairly clear about what triggers yeah. them having to come back. I don't think I can be that clear, and, and I'm not going to be on the board in a year. My term is up at the end of this year, so certainly it wouldn't be appropriate for me to make that motion, so enough said. I'm done. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Mark, if I will begin on the left and move right. Um, I wanted to sort of go back to some basics, and first of all, Sam, kind of, uh, I'm glad that we were able to view the last month's proceedings on the videotape. It was very helpful, and I apologize for, for not having been there. Uh, that being said, I'd like to uh, revisit a couple issues, uh, perhaps one at a time, going back to some basics. Uh, the uh, driveway uh, that now is three feet off the property line uh, with a buffer uh, was something that has, has concerned me following last month's uh, presentation, uh, the whole notion of, uh, of an, an abutter needing to compensate for neighboring development and the suggestion last month that a buffer be placed on the abutter's own property uh, struck me as uh, very unusual. Uh, one of the things that in, in looking for what the standards are in the, uh, in the ordinance, one of the things that I noticed, I got out the town center ordinance, and on page 72, uh, under uh, all other uses for minimum setback of parking, including aisles from a property line, there's a requirement of 15 feet, uh, which said it can be reduced to zero for shared parking at the common property line. And from what has transpired to date on this application, I'm not sure we have a shared parking concept operational here anymore. We do not have uh, uh, parking on one parcel using hours of, at one time of the day, uh, sharing a common lot with a property, another parcel that has parking demand at other hours of the day. Uh, the applicant stated in the cover letter of the, uh, this month's update that they're seeking no waivers. I was wondering if the, the board has any discussion on that or if the applicant has any comment on that at this point. Uh, one thing I'm trying to figure out is which, where are you referring to in the town center plan? You must have a different, I'm looking at the ordinance that includes town center. Yeah, Sorry. page 72 of, of my current copy yeah, has a chart. Well, it's always hard to follow this thing because it would be 19-6-4-D, dash 2 is a big chart, <clears throat> which goes through all the dimensional criteria of the town center zone. Uh, 19-6-4. Four, which is the town center section. D is standards. Uh, D.1 is the performance standards, and D.2 is the space and bulk standards. If you go to the oh, near the end of those space and bulk standards. It's a long chart that goes over a series of several pages. There's a section, uh, well, let's see, one, two, three, four, the, the fourth grouping from the end of that chart is a, there's a heading that says minimum setback of parking, including parking aisles from property line. And this was part of the town center uh, ordinance, which was developed uh, to give room for things like snow storage and plantings and, and whatnot between adjacent properties when, um, when necessary. If you look at the site plan, and Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is from the property line uh, more than a 15 foot system setback from parking to the property line. Parking is concerned, yes, that's correct. 
the heading of the chapter, the heading on the chart says minimum setback of parking including parking aisles. Would you call that a parking aisle behind those parking spaces or not? I would call that access for ingress and egress and given that it was created originally because of a request for shared access yeah. uh, and an easement given to the what is now the Johnson property, mm -hmm. uh, we're in the impression that we wanted to keep, the, or this easement actually, you know, before we got involved, uh, when the easement was originally created, mm -hmm. uh, it was created for uh, the maximum benefit for what is now the Johnson property uh, in order to keep their traffic as close to their property and utilizing mm -hmm. this as absolutely possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so, those, so those parking spaces don't have a parking aisle to access them? They come over a something else in, in your opinion? You mean the parking spaces that are in this section right in here? Yes. Well, the minimum uh, length of it, this is the uh, site plan, I may. the minimum length of this is uh, uh, 18, 18 to 19 feet. What we have done is actually extended this by up to four feet. Right? So as far as the, uh, the back, if you're concerned about this being a parking aisle and backing into it, Yes. Um, we actually have, given the distance here and the depth of these parking areas, if you add up the distance from the actual property line to here, we're looking at uh, 16 and 18 feet, 17 and 18 feet. That's, uh, um, 30, well, that's interesting. I'd, I'd be interested in what other board members think because my impression of this is that pavement stays 15 feet from a property line. Pavement stays 15 feet away. Had, yeah, you can't put a driveway or a parking space closer than 15 feet to a lot line. Uh, is there another interpretation of that that I'm not following here? Not really yeah, following, yeah. and the town engineer never said that, oh. and the planner didn't, mm -hmm. and this is also an existing use of a driveway on a boundary, so I'm not sure uh, the interpretation would be. Mr. Mr. Chairman? Tom, go right ahead. I just want to be clear that I'm understanding Mark's point. Your point is that because this is not now shared, a shared parking concept, right. that the requirement uh, is increased from whatever it is up to 15 feet. Um, Could I interrupt for just a second? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm missing one thing, I guess, the shared parking concept. Um, it's not any longer that. I, can you explain what there's, a, there's an annotation here that says parking setback may be, be reduced to zero feet mm -hmm. for shared parking lot, a shared parking lot at the common property line, uh, which would mean, say, two neighbors decided to share a parking lot and place it straddling their lot line. By definition, you inherently couldn't have a setback there because you'd have the paving of the parking lot straddling the lot line. up here. Right, you have right. you have that sort of condition up the, up there. Right, and then an existing use, which has historically always been this portion. Uh, that's an existing use, yes. But I would uh, I would go. Uh, I think that's worth discussion. Uh, the existing use does not include includes the traffic to the abutters parcel, but not the the traffic and parking on your parcel. Uh, you have a new a new use, not an existing use. But from a technical standpoint, when you're looking at the distances involved, if you're, let, let's uh, assume the, uh, the hypothetical of a shared parking area with the, at least the minimum width of the aisle space with parking at 90 degrees uh, or a lesser angle off of that space, 24 feet being the aisle width, the required aisle width for 90 degree parking. If that's the case, and uh, assuming that both uh, entities, parking entities as it were, are sharing that space equally, that then cuts down that aisle space to 12 feet of shared space, off yes. of which parking is generated shared. on both sides. Yeah, that would be a shared parking arrangement. Right. Yeah. In this case, we have considerably more than that, primarily because we are dealing with the situation of the easement that was granted uh, to the Johnsons on the Westerly Abutter for the purposes of accessing their lot. Not parking. Mark, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Go right ahead, Tom. My concern here is, is whether it's, regardless of whether it's the Johnsons or the current applicant, I, I, I don't want to get someone put into a double jeopardy situation where 
the Johnsons came before this board and got approval to relocate this driveway on the applicant's property, and that was a shared — that easement is, was for shared parking to the rear, and the, and the previous project was approved with the parking in the rear. Uh, the Johnsons have expressed concerns about the visual impact or other impacts from the proposed parking for the restaurant side in an effort to deal with that. The applicants have shifted the driveway over a little bit, and they've also provided additional landscape buffer between the, rear, the two rear parking lots, the, the Johnson's and the one for the proposed restaurant. Um, what it — under, under your discussion, it sounds to me as, as um, this is a, it's a circular issue and, and uh, it's double jeopardy. Um, it, it, the, the minute this driveway is located onto this property, it, it becomes, in my opinion, uh, and uh, I'm not expressing my opinion as part of the code enforcement of the planning department of the town, but as a, as a uh, member of the planning board, um, that's a shared driveway used to gain access to two rear parking lots. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, it, but it, right now, the, none of the parking is shared. You have parking for one parcel, parking for another parcel, and you have uh, a uh, right-of-way easement from over one lot to another, uh, and there is no real shared parking at this point. We have an access — we just have one abutter with an access easement across another abutter's land. I think at the time this driveway is approved to be relocated, the concept was that it would be shared parking. No, I think what we're faced with now is a mutual decision mm -hmm not decision, but a mutual situation that neither party is interested in, in sharing that, that parking, literally sharing the mm -hmm. parking. But it doesn't look or smell like shared parking right could now. I, could I ask one more thing or point out one more thing, I think, in clarification? Please go ahead. Um, I, from the way I read this now, I'm starting to remember this. It's the parking setback. That's what we're talking about. The parking setback is 15 feet. Our parking setback is 15 feet. It doesn't say the paving for it. Um, the access way would be 15 feet. Well, the head of the thing says, including parking aisles. So your parking aisle would have to be 15 feet I don't know, maybe from the long line. Say In that case. <clears throat> is, there any, is there any other? I'd like to just offer some thoughts. I Items guess. that relate to that? Yes. Um, when, when this language was written, the intent was to encourage the use of shared curb cuts and parking, um, specifically looking at uh, some of the recommendations that have come out from the Maine Department of Transportation and just good planning practice that shared curb cuts reduce the number of turning movements onto roads and therefore reduce the opportunities for conflict. Uh, before this current ordinance was adopted, the old site plan regulations specifically said that you had to have a 10-foot ten ten foot setback from a property line unless the driveway was shared. So I think, you know, the reason the code officer and I never looked at this twice was because it's very difficult to have shared parking lots without having a shared curb cut. And it's very difficult to get property owners to agree to share a curb cut. <laughs> and when they do, uh, the last thing you want to have is something in the ordinance that then forces them to push away from each other because of a setback. And that's why that was written. It really was meant to include the, the, the way to get to the parking lot as well as sharing the parking lot itself. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I thought I heard on TV, and I'm sorry I wasn't here last, 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 week, last month, was that um, the location of this is just really a um, that it is an access and it is not actually uh, described uh, you know, the physical location of where it exists, that the access to the abutter really has to go across this parcel, but it is not a, a defined sort of meets and bounds type of easement. Is that That's basically correct. That if I true? can check the easement, but I think what it says is that we share a driveway as now exists, which is a traditional way, less accurate than one should have, but the existing, the existing driveway and the um, owner, the servient state mm -hmm. owner, has the right to relocate that driveway if they so choose. So when during the planning phase, that was considered. For example, it could have come over through here instead, moved way over into the middle of the lot. But again, with the balancing of breaking up the lot, of the removal of trees, that the, it made most sense to have it remain where it is.
everything, everything else in the application, I, I, the, as I watched TV, I thought was uh, very thoroughly done and well, well presented. Uh, the, uh, the aspect of, of that orientation of the building, I think, is one that is uh, perhaps more a question of perception than uh, its uh, performance under the ordinance. The ordinance says that the a building should be, be sort of oriented toward the street and have a presence on the street, but it doesn't require everybody to come and go on the street. Quite the contrary, it requires everybody to park in the side and the rear and, and says really that despite that you're supposed to orient the building so it looks like it doesn't have its back end of the street, which this uh, application I think has done fairly well. Uh, if there are any other uh, things that relate to, to this, I'll let other folks chip in here. Al, go right ahead. Chairman, I think I left the uh, last meeting with uh, two major concerns. One was the uh, complaint by the Johnsons, the about us, of the lack of fence. And I think that has clearly uh, been met here tonight in the uh, proposal for the fence. Uh, the second uh, point was raised by Mr. Emery, and I agree with him that uh, some attempt should be made, although it may sound a little undemocratic, uh, but I think it's necessary to, uh, to preserve this locale, that is to limit the hours of operation. I would be in favor of a limit uh, from uh, opening at 7 a.m. And, and closing at 10 at night, or at least the doors, uh, obviously people could be out. I think, as Mr. Emery points out, that the applicant uh, at the end of the year could come back and uh, if it needed more time in the morning or more time at night, uh, certainly the board could consider it. But I would be willing to, uh, to go along with uh, the proposal, if it had that uh, amendment to it. I think, too, that the um, letter submitted by Council uh, Hill uh, is extremely important. I think it's necessary to read into any decision that we make uh, the findings that uh, the existing property is in current state of uh, gross uh, disrepair and that the project uh, will not adversely affect, in my opinion, the abutting properties uh, either in noise, odor, headlights, or increased traffic or other effects. When I say other effects, I'm specifically including my prior comment about hours of operation. I think the compatibility with the existing uses and purposes, uh, a village feeling mixed uh, retail, residential uses, and uh, this restaurant should be uh, permitted within the, uh, the, within the district. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Al. Before I ask the applicant to address your concerns about time of operation, I'd like to hear other comments from the board in regarding that matter. Regarding which matter? The hours of operation. Um, <clears throat> I had a number of questions, but I'll just I'll stick with the hours right now. I think I'll it's return only to fair you yep. that the, um, the applicant tell us what they would like to have for hours, what they think their hours are going to be. And I think that's going to tell us what kind of you know, restaurant um, it's going to be. And I think it's a, a fair question um, in light of the neighbor's concerns. Thank you. David, do you have any concerns? You had your hand up. Um, I pretty much concur with uh, um, the restaurant uh, owners to tell us basically uh, what their hours are before we set any standards. Any other members of the board wish to comment before I ask the applicant? No, I think that's a good approach. Okay. Could the applicant Answer the question if they could. I first want to make a big sigh, if you'll bear with me, because this has been um, a very frustrating 
topic for us because this is a first of its kind operation in the town center. One of the crucial aspects for making a business go or not are when, what hours of operation you have. We don't know yet what that's going to be. Um, although with all due respect to Mike Hill and his comments, I think there is some problem in tying hours of operation to minimizing adverse impact from a legal perspective. But as always with everything that we've been doing, we, we tried, we talked about this this afternoon after um, looking at the correspondence. I think that in terms of saying 10 o'clock, no more seating after 10 o'clock, which is how I'd like to have it worded. My problem with hours of operation is that you have to have cleanup, you have to have a lot of different things going on after that. I'd like to say that the seating after 10 o'clock, um, no more seating is would be fine because I, my, our suspicion is, based on what's happened, it happens in the whole Portland area, is that most of the year it's going to be 9 o'clock or 9.30. And, but there is a concern of having to come back here again and the concern for financing purposes, for actual operation, that we had such a restriction on that we couldn't live with it. The 7 a.m. is a little bit more of a surprise to me. I don't know if, if everybody's up and at them in this town in the morning People who want coffee want it before 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, Jonesy's is already open. You know, Cumberland Farms is open. Kids going to school that early in the morning. Um, and we really hadn't even talked about the morning issue because it's not where um, the concern would be in terms of sound and that kind of thing. Um, I, so our preference would be to say that the hours of oper that the that the condition if there's any at all, which I really don't want, if there's a condition, it is that the operation, that the um, restaurant may not accept any more seating after 10 p.m. at night. That's what our preference is. I if can uh, accept that, Mr. Thank you. And, and uh, I uh, want to say that on the 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, that was prompted by my own profession, which is a law. I don't go to work until 9. So 7 <laughs> is an extremely early hour for me, but not, necessary, not necessarily for everyone else. So I would uh, be happy to remove the morning uh, hour and uh, leave that to the economics of the uh, neighborhood. And uh, no more seating after 10. I'm perfectly satisfied with that. Steve, I promise to come back to you for the rest of your concerns and questions. Um, <clears throat> There was mentioned someplace, and I can't point to it exactly, um, that you hadn't decided whether or not to apply for a liquor license? Correct. Have you decided? No, we have not investigated it yet. You have not decided? No. Um, okay. Looking at the plan, you've got a fairly large deck out here. Um, I can't imagine what the, the deck would be used for other than outside dining in the summertime. And it says specifically, I think, in the booklet tonight that there's not going to be any outside dining. Um, is that something you think may evolve over a period of time? There is that possibility. At this point, we see it more as a gathering and waiting area or um, for people, kids coming up in bikes. Um, Perry's working on design for the deck, which would have uh, you know, benches around the side of it. There is a possibility. Again, we've, we don't know at this point, but there is a possibility, I suppose, that we could put some seats out there in the summertime. We would be restricted by what the use is inside and how much we would put out there. Because we still need only, we only have 40 seats. <clears throat> okay, it mentions someplace that um, you're anticipating a fair amount of takeout business. Um, I believe the butters are um, continuing to assert that. we have we. At this point, expect to have a sit-down restaurant um, with people coming in and getting coffee and um, and um, and having and pizza. We are not planning a significant takeout at this time. I okay. Well, I, I don't mean to be a smart guy here. But we don't have a pizza store in town. Um, pizza shop. It seems to me if there's a decent pizza available, people are going to come. And it means it's going to be a very heavily, heavily trafficked um, site 
for people, I mean, I, I go out and pick up pizzas for my kids all the time. Now I have to drive to South Portland to do it. Um, we don't have to drive that far. You know, we'll be standing in line as well, but that's going to mean a lot of people coming there specifically for a takeout, and that's going to mean a lot of temporary traffic. Um, and frankly, I just don't think the site is going to handle the traffic well, but that's a separate issue altogether. Um, okay. The menu I'm not going to even ask about, but I think that's going to dictate a lot of what happens afterward um, of what you decide to serve. The one thing I want to touch back on is the shared driveway issue that Mark, Mr. Wilcox brought up. I, for one, would like to have the town attorney um, review that and see where we stand with that. I'm just not feeling comfortable. We were, you know, we're going, we're sort of bucking the ordinance, yet we hear from the town planner that the intent of the ordinance was something slightly different than what was written. So I'm just confused. I would like to have that addressed. Can I comment? Feel free. It's I, I hope you can imagine how extremely frustrating this is to hear because we have dotted every I, crossed every T. We've had pre-meetings, we've had workshop meetings, we've had meetings after hearing meetings, we've had a lot of meetings, we've paid a lot of money for the town engineer to review all this, and in each of those instances, they accepted, the, they agreed that this is a shared access into the parking areas, and it was never brought up. The fact that we're now going to have to go around again for another month for this, I've, I, we really have a problem with that. And if there's any way you can work it out now, Without doing that, we'd greatly appreciate it. <clears throat> well, I, for one, do not feel comfortable <clears throat> dealing with this right now. I really want the town attorney to take a look at it. But I'm just one member. <clears throat> David, further comments? I have a couple of comments. Um, I am pleased to see that you've done... Um, some work to put together the uh, separation of the properties. I think that's inadequate, and I, and I hope the abutters uh, appreciate your efforts. Uh, regarding uh, the exhaust system in the kitchen, uh, I have a couple of comments. Um, the picture of the installation, uh, let me back up a second. Where, do, you, do you know where on the roof you are going to... Uh, Put your exhaust system. I believe it is shown on one of the elevations right here. It's on the back side, on the easterly side. Okay. Because that's the kitchen area, so that's where they uh, suggested it to go at this point. I, the fan, the exhaust fan that's shown there is, does not meet code. But um, okay. the one that's in your booklet here. That's used as a But I think that, that can be cleared up by the Code Enforcement Office. So you have to meet NFPA standards. And that is from the NFPA, right. whatever but it's called, um, gr um, group. But the fact is I may have picked, like, 1B instead of 1A. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I would like to see, as a member of the board, because of its proximity and being in a neighborhood, that there be some shielding to eliminate the noise uh, the free field noise should not be much of a problem. Usually they use a mushroom type uh, up glass fan and a screen around that on all four sides uh, would help to eliminate the noise that travels directly across to the neighbors. And I know we don't have a noise ordinance, but those are the kind of things that keep people awake at night. And uh, it's not much of a problem to do, but uh, I, I would think that that would be, I would recommend that be a condition of the approval if it's so given. Those are my only comments. Thank you, David. Mark? I'm not cutting anybody off. I wanted to go back to something that uh, Mr. Parkhurst uh, brought up and sort of touched upon uh, that I was kind of curious about also, which was uh, the use of the, of the outside deck. And, uh, and right now, um, it sounds like it's really not definitely uh, pin down exactly what it would be used for, but is it is it uh, is it is it patron space for patrons of the restaurant? 
Yes, if I understand what you're asking. Because uh, there's another issue that has to do with interpretation of the ordinance that I was wondering if I could explore with the board. Uh, our parking ordinance uh, describes under restaurants and eating places one space per four patrons. It doesn't say seats. It says patrons, uh, which could, one could interpret as being all the people who have come to your restaurant. Uh, one out of every four of them needs to have a parking space. Uh, right, well, one option, I suppose, would be to remove the deck completely, so we take care of that. But mm -hmm. the point of the deck originally was to create the ambiance, the town center of entering, of having a feel, mm -hmm. of people being able to walk in so that the patrons can sit down inside. Mm -hmm. is, is there been any, uh, did I miss any discussion of that last month, or has there been any? To my memory, there has been no discussion of that. Okay, because I took a look at the restaurant itself, and if one looks at the, the areas that are allocated within the restaurant for, and in terms of areas, um, and one reason one might do that is uh, also in the ordinance, uh, underneath that requirement, it says measurement of seating and standing capacity shall be based upon the latest adopted edition of the Boca National Building Code and NFPA 101, whichever is more stringent. Uh, those, uh, those two codes would both tell you that uh, to allow 15 square feet per person. And from the, uh, and, it, and it's difficult because the drawing of the restaurant is not scaled. Uh, the site plan uh, calls out the front part of the restaurant at 490 square feet, which is one large dining room. Uh, and if one sort of lops off a zone along the uh, easterly side where the bathrooms are, uh, there's somewhere around uh, 600 to 636 square feet in the, in the center entry section, uh, which is a total of 1,126 square feet. And if you divide that by 15 square feet per person, that would be 75 people. And if you divided that by four, because one out of four generates a car, that would be 19 spaces. And then if you added five for employees, you'd be up to 24. Uh, if you look at the deck, that would be over and above that. Uh, it, it seems to me uh, that there are 40 seats drawn on the plan, uh, but that the size of the restaurant is something that under these standards uh, would accommodate more people. Would you uh, have any further information you could, or would there be further discussion amongst the board of that? May I respond? Go right ahead, please. We are willing to limit this restaurant to 40 people to come in and sit down. We will obey all the Boca codes. Where we're continuing to have the existing footprint, adding a small amount, because our architect, in looking at the interior, felt that that was appropriate because of the type of kitchen and brick oven. There's no point here in that we are trying to build bigger than we need, that's for sure. And um, we're willing to do a restriction of 40 people. Thank you. And addressing the concern as to how we count the patrons in a business, I think it's unfair to ask the applicant to take into consideration people who are en route to their business, who are there awaiting to be seated within their business, because the factor cannot be determined. It's unknown. And, and therefore can't be used as a condition of approval, in my opinion. Well, my, my point was that within the restaurant itself, the public area of the restaurant is, generates a greater parking demand than what's been accommodated on this site. Uh, unless the applicant is seeking a waiver or the town has some uh, mechanism for enforcing seating capacity in public areas, uh, which I'm unaware of, uh, I don't think any town anybody from the town would be going around and visiting restaurants. Uh, what's, what's in the ordinance is in the ordinance. This would be the same thing, though, Mark, is asking a doctor to count the seats in his waiting room and determining the number of spaces he needed in his parking lot. Uh, it gets... Do. We never have. <laughs> well, Go right I ahead, Tom. Chime in for a minute. I don't see anything wrong with posting this restaurant for a maximum of 40 seating capacity. If... if an owner of a restaurant decides to allow 18 square feet per patron. Um, 
the community center back here has rooms posted because of the type of fire protection or the type of structure that it is, that it has limitations on the maximum occupancy, and those rooms are posted accordingly. Whether the town then wants to take it upon itself to visit those uh, establishments occasionally uh, to see that that's enforced, that's, that's an enforcement issue. Uh, but I think if we, the applicant has indicated that they're willing to put on the record that they will have a maximum of 40 seats, um, aside from the issue on the outside seating of potential disturbance to the abutters because of additional noise or, or anything like that, if there were, if there were t f a total of 40 patrons and it were noontime and I was the 35th patron and I was there with three other people and I was unable, I mean, I certainly would like to take advantage of, of on-deck seating if, if it's appropriate to the neighborhood and appropriate in terms of the type of uh, operation. I'm not suggesting that if, if this turns into a dance club that uh, people be allowed to dance out on the deck, but I don't see that there's anything particularly wrong if three staff people from town hall want to go over and have a quiet lunch on the deck as long as the total uh, capacity of the, of the facility doesn't exceed 40. Um, and, I, and I certainly would hate to see the amendment that's being, I mean, the, uh, uh, the, the improvement that's being made here, the amenity that's being proposed here is discouraged because of our concern that there might be more people than, than uh, every square inch can be accommodated in terms of parking. Uh, the other thing in terms of the liquor license, um, I think that makes a big difference in the type of operation, but it also has a second level of control and also another uh, opportunity for public input. And that license is a state license and also one that has to be approved by the town council, if I'm not mistaken, and, that, and that's renewed on an annual basis. So for whatever reason, if because of there was a liquor license uh, granted here, anyone in town, including the abutters, could come forth and testify before the town council of, of issues that might be arising. And it's always unfortunate that if problems develop, it force the public to go and then try to shut down an establishment. But clearly there's evidence that that's happened in Portland and, and enforcement action has been taken and liquor licenses have been closed and restaurants have been closed for not being operated uh, appropriately. Thank you, Tom. But I, I, I thank Mark. I mean, he's done an awful lot of work to try to understand whether or not the parking is, is, is adequate, and, and he's brought the whole board, and I think the applicant and the public up to speed that there may be some flexibility here. But I think limiting this to 40 occupants or whatever the code would allow uh, based on the number of employees and the number of parking spaces for patrons is certainly appropriate. Well, Mark is definitely the strongest member of the board as far as interpreting uh, zoning on this. He's kept us out of trouble in the past, and I always thank him for that. I had a little bit of an explanation. I know right ahead, Terry. Here. There was a lot of discussion last time about what it means to be a village and the, the sort of uses that are anticipated here. And I guess it's important to realize that this is not you know, the main mall where you are sort of expected to have your own parking on your own lot. This is a true village. And the, you know, the, uh, the, the town center guidelines talk about the uniqueness of the town center. Uh, the enrichment, the linkages. And I think what's anticipated is people are going to be coming to the village for more than a single purpose. They're going to, going to the real estate office or the library or the school and then leaving their car someplace. I mean, maybe it's here at town hall or over at the, the auxiliary town meeting building and simply walking across the street. We like to think there's people going to be actually walking to the restaurant or even riding their bikes. We have provided bicycle facilities. We've heard Helen talk tonight about people arriving by bicycle. So we're really looking at a whole range of transportation issues here that aren't dealt with on the, uh, the amount of parking that we have here. We really think that parking is a shared resource for all the various businesses within the town center. Thank you. Nancy? <coughs> you might want to bring your microphone closer. Question for Maureen. On page one of your memo, you state, the traffic study demonstrates that Route 77 Shore Road, Scott Dyer Road <clears throat> intersection currently qualifies for a red-green traffic signal, and that this project will increase traffic to the intersection. Um, because the town council has, has previous, previously decided not to install a red green traffic light <coughs> at this inter intersection, the planning board 
might, may choose to approve the project under subsection C by t determining that town policy does not support the construction improvements. Uh, first of all, I looked for subsection C and couldn't find it. <clears throat> and <clears throat> secondly, this sort of flies in the face of the applicant's um, statement of significant note in the initial and the second page at the bottom. <coughs> In the initial traffic report, the engineer states that this project has very lim limited impact on the operational capacity of the town center intersection. <coughs> In the second report, the analysis actually shows a decrease on, on traffic in the area of the project. Those seem to conflict. Yes, and, and there probably would have been a little bit clearer way to put it. Um, the applicant, and let me try to answer a couple of those questions. The applicant did prepare a traffic study as part of this project, and they submitted it in their original package, which I believe was July or August. And um, in that package, uh, they studied the intersection. They hired a traffic engineer who's also been hired by the town on other occasions. And um, when you look at an intersection to determine whether or not it, it would be suitable for a red-green, I call it a red-green traffic light, there are several criteria or warrants that are applied. Uh, for example, one of them is, is if it's a high traffic location. If there's been uh, more than, I think, three accidents in, in a one-year period or more than oh, one accident a year. We've seen that. Right. And they looked at that intersection and um, they studied the intersection in the summer months. Mm -hmm. And the determination was, based on those, those standards, that you could install an inter a light at that intersection now mm -hmm. without the restaurant. Um, they predicted what the impact of the restaurant impact would be uh, the restaurant traffic, and it was a, a, a small increase. So it didn't trigger any additional warrants that would require a traffic signal. It was an increase to the intersection. Uh, the planning board was concerned that the uh, current traffic counts, those were the summer traffic counts, were low. Because if you factor in what happens once school starts, in fact, there will probably be a lot more traffic at that intersection, and then the restaurant would also have a greater impact. So the applicant was asked to recount the intersection after school started. And what they're referring in that letter that you just read on the bottom of that second page was when you compare the traffic counts from the summer to the traffic counts for the fall, the traffic counts in the fall are lower mm -hmm. than the traffic counts in the summer. Mm -hmm. But even in the fall, that intersection could stand a traffic light under those criteria right now. Um, and again, the, the restaurant will add traffic to that intersection. It doesn't make the intersection need in the, a traffic light any more than it does now. It doesn't trigger any more of those warrants. And to answer your last question on, on the standards, um, under the approval standards, which are under Section 19-9-5 under the site plan regulations, we have several different standards. Standard B talks about traffic access and parking. And under traffic access and parking, there are several substandards. The first substandard, which is sub one, is adequacy of the road system. And development not meeting a requirement of turning intersection below level of service D um, may be approved if the applicant demonstrates one of three things. A, a public agency has committed funds to construct the improvements necessary to bring the level of access to this standard. Clearly, no public agency has proposed to improve the intersection lately. B, the applicant will assume financial responsibility for the improvements necessary to bring the level of service to this standard and will assure the completion of the improvements with the financial guarantee acceptable to the municipality. So, for example, if the town wanted a traffic light at that intersection and there was no pending financial grant from the Maine Department of Transportation to put in a traffic light, 
you could ask this applicant to pay for a traffic light. However, the third section here says the town policy does not support the construction improvements. The reason that third standard was put in there is because we don't want to put the applicant in a position of saying that you cannot get your project approved unless you do this improvement and the town does not want the improvement. That's a catch-22 situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is not an uncommon situation. There are times when a project may generate traffic that might warrant the creation of a right turn lane. And the concern of the community is that the widening of a road to create a right turn lane is not consistent with the character you want to promote. And therefore, you say, we don't want the right turn lane. We're going to accept the standard that, that your project is going to create. So that's why that third condition is in there. Um, can I answer your question? Thank you. Very well. <laughs> Anything further, Nancy? Well, as I said it last time, I <clears throat> am very concerned <coughs> about the traffic. <coughs> um, <clears throat> I think it's going to increase, and um, <clears throat> we saw it piling up um, the night we had a, a sidewalk. And um, I cited waving at uh, the um, the little house that I do my basketry in to get out, to go left. And um, cars come barreling around that corner. Um, where the bank is, um, and uh, I am concerned about noise and odors too, with the, the neighbors, and all in all, I think it's too small a lot for a restaurant. So that's where I stand. <clears throat> Thank you, Nancy. I just have two comments. Uh, as an individual, I'm uncomfortable with the driveway now becoming an issue, making it difficult for this lot to be developed for whatever reason. And because the planning board, a couple of years back, when your butter, the Johnsons were in for their application, we played a substantial role in creating this shared driveway. And that's why I now have a discomfort in, in seeing it used as a difficulty, another hurdle for the applicant to go through. That's just a comment. In regards to takeout business, uh, I mentioned at our previous <coughs> meeting that I spent too many years in the restaurant and hotel business. If you do your market research, the consumer that's interested in takeout food uh, is interested because one, they are hungry, two, they don't have any time, and three, they are tired. Uh, you can meet their needs by offering a delivery service, and you will also reduce the amount of traffic going in and out of your driveway, and you would also reduce the number of people milling around on your deck. If you wish to have that as part of your business, I only offer it as a recommendation. Those are my only two comments. Uh, all of my concerns were addressed by other members of the board, so I'll be brief. Can I make one comment on the You certainly may. Issue? Uh, it occurred to me, I don't know if it's possible so that we can move this forward one way or the other, to um, ha can the applicant request a waiver orally at, the, at a hearing? And if so, could we request a waiver if it so turns out that the ordinance would be read um, as Mr. Wilcox think it, thinks it may, that we waive that particular requirement? due to the uh, uniqueness of the lot and um, the existing approvals with the abutter in front of the planning board. That's a question I need Maureen to answer. If I understand correctly, you're asking if, um, if there is a 15-foot setback requirement that should be applied to your lot, can this board waive it? Yes. Um, I, be I believe the answer to that would be no. Uh, waivers from setbacks or reductions in setbacks would have to be granted by the zoning board. OK, 
Okay, how about this? Can it be a condition of some sort? <clears throat> Go right ahead, Steve. Maureen's thinking. <laughs> well, I've got an answer. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go right ahead, Maureen. Well, I, I, I guess one way to move this forward, I, I, I believe what you're going to want me to ask the town attorney is, does the 15-foot setback apply to this project? Is that the answer? That's the question. So you could write a condition in such a way that if it does, the applicant must return to the planning board, and if it doesn't, it's a conditional approval. It, um, Go ahead, Steve. The reason why I really want to have this checked out, uh, I don't know if anyone other than the members of the planning board at the podium tonight have read the October 13th issue of the American Journal. In one of those stories on one page, the Cape Elizabeth page, is vision of Cape Town Center and reality aren't meeting. That's the headline. And not to take any credit for this, but I requested that we have a meeting about the, the town center zone and its lack of anything happening in it. Um, so we had a workshop meeting just to sort of try to figure out what's really going on, because everything that seems to get approved by the planning board ends up in uh, legal action. So nothing is getting built. Um, nothing is happening. I really think it would be a prudent thing to do to have that checked clearly, because uh, I don't know how strong the abutters, neighbors, there was a whole bunch of correspondence on the podium tonight, feel about this project and how many of them feel strongly enough to call their lawyer and say, hey, you know, let's file a suit and we can stop the project for a while. And, you know, I have to commend you. I think you've done a, a wonderful job trying to address all the things that have needed to be addressed. Uh, the one ordinance type item that seems to have come forward tonight is the one we're talking about. I really, th truly think that needs to be checked out. Otherwise, I think you're just setting yourself up for, for problems. In that scenario, I understand what you're saying, and truly the only um, person in that scenario that's hurt is the applicant itself, that it's risking um, litigation, although I understand the town is sued too. But um, I would suggest that the perhaps medium ground here um, would be to do something in the conditional approval, if, if this goes that way, um, that Maureen would suggest um, so that we maybe can um, not come back in November. Mr. Emery? Yeah, th this one's a real tough one for me because I, as I said before, this is, this is the ultimate in je double jeopardy. Um, these two lots were looked at together by the planning board. Um, the applicant has shifted the driveway due to the concerns of the abutter. Um, and I, I just, I, I mean, if, if, this, if, this, if the 15 foot setback doesn't work, then let's put the driveway back between the two houses and, and uh, put the existing parking lot back to all the required setbacks from the existing property line and, and let this individual or this applicant then develop, uh, develop this lot as an individual lot and be done with it. I mean, that to me is sort of the worst case ultimate, but it somewhat makes sense. I mean, either, either this is a shared concept or it isn't. The minute this driveway was built, we have a, a mixed business use here. It's generally in conformance, and conformance with the town center has been reviewed and approved by the planning board. Now to have the person who granted that easement be told that, uh, oh, by the way, your driveway has to be 15 feet farther into the property, and, and, and perhaps the applicant would say, okay, that's fine. Let's, let's move it 15 feet farther into the property if that's what, what it requires. It's going to be, it's going to cost them more money, it's, but it doesn't do anything for this plan that I can see. I mean... Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Wilcox. Well, let me just finish my, yeah. my thought. I would be, if, if it even has to go to town attorney, if it's decided it's prudent, if the board wants to send it to town attorney, I would prefer to make that a condition of approval rather than hold up um, this applicant on one matter such as that. Thank you, Tom. I thought you were through. I apologize. No, sorry. Mark? Um, I also spent some time looking at and, and trying to come to grips with this whole, as, as Tom 
refers to it as the double jeopardy issue here. And as I started looking at the demand for parking in the area, area involved in the restaurant and coming to the conclusion that an applicant can, can uh, maintain that there would only be 40 people in the restaurant at any given time, uh, but how that could actually ever happen in reality, I'm not sure anybody could even can begin to control something like that. And that the, the disparity in the parking demand of the facility with a small kitchen on the back and much larger and the, and the large dining areas, I then that said to myself, uh, what if the abutter were developing this property? Would that make a difference in this sideline? And in my own mind, I came to the conclusion that no, because the facility itself is still over, overburdening the site in terms of its parking demand. Uh, so unless the use were different or scaled back, even if the abutter came forward with this and the uh, parking lot setback issue went away, there still isn't enough parking for this use. And that's my uh, conclusion at this point. Uh, I don't think I would even support uh, uh, the conditional approval at this point. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Go right ahead, please. One more question on this, just so I see where you're coming from on the ordinance with this. If you look at our page 189, um, which is under approval, site plan approval 19-9-5B, traffic and access, to access into the site. Are you there yet? D. Uh, go, th go through the numbers. I think a newer, newer copy. 19 9 5. Approval standards under site plan. Yeah. B. Traffic access and parking. Yeah. 2. Access into the site. Mm -hmm. D. No part of any driveway should be located with a minimum of 10 feet from a side property line. However, the planning board may permit a driveway serving two or more adjacent sites to be located on or within 10 feet of a side property line dividing the adjacent sites. Um, and so I'm trying to understand so that, the differences between these if this is termed a driveway. <clears throat> two. I, I think that's a good point that the applicant raises there. Uh, that there can be a, a reduction in that 15 feet apparently uh, for this, uh, for this uh, which, which is a sort of a town-wide as opposed to a town center uh, requirement. So that would be 10 feet instead of 15 feet. <clears throat> While we're thinking about it, though, one other thing, um, Mr. Wilcox, mm -hmm. I once again remind you is that we did talk to the dentist in terms of overflow parking and the fact that um, the multiplier under the code does um, allow us the amount of parking spaces that we have proposed. Uh, what was the last? that the ordinance for the amount of seats we're going to have allows the amount of parking spaces we have. And we've gone beyond that to get a, um, uh, an abutter to um, approve for us to have a Do you still have the same concerns, Mark, or have they been addressed? Uh, yes, because the ordinance doesn't say the word seats. The ordinance has to do with the size of your facility. Okay. If there is no further discussion at this time, does the board wish to call a motion? Mr. Emery. I'd like to uh, propose a motion. A uh, motion for the board to consider um, findings of facts. One, 1231 Shore Road Associates is requesting site plan review of a proposed 40 seat restaurant to be located at 1231 Shore Road in the Scout House, which requires review under Section 19 9 site plan regulations. Two, the application was deemed complete and a public hearing was held on September 21, 1999. Three, the site must be developed in accordance with the approved plans in order to comply with the site plan regulations and the town center guidelines, and a performance guaranteed is the method that the town uses to assure construction consistent with the approved plans. Four, the town engineer has identified issues which need to be clarified in order to avoid confusion regarding what is required on the approved plans. 
Five, the application substantially complies with Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulations and Section 19-6-4 D3 Town Center Design Requirements. Therefore, be it ordered that, that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of 1231 Associates with Paul Woods and Helen Muther. Yes, with an ER at the end. As principals for site plan review of a proposed 40-seat restaurant to be located at 1231 Shore Road in the Scout House be approved with the following conditions. One, that a performance guarantee be provided in accordance with Section 16-2-4C7A prior to issuance of a building permit or any alteration to the site. Two, that the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated October 12, 1999, paragraphs 2 and 3, and submitted to the town planner for review. Three, that there be no alteration to the site nor issuance of a building permit until the above conditions have been met. Actually, that should be the last condition. Um, the uh, condition three shall read that a snow fence be uh, provided around the trees to be saved as close to the drip line as practicable. That either uh, four, that either the number of the perennials or the spacing of the perennials be provided on the plan. Uh, five, if a picket fence is to be located in front of the building, that it be no higher than 36 inches. And six, that the final design of the uh, fence along the Wesley property line be submitted to the town planner for review and approval. Is that six? Mm -hmm. And seven, that there be no alteration to the site nor issuance of a building permit until the above conditions have been met. Is there a second to Mr. Emery's motion? There is a second to the motion. The motion is now open for discussion amongst board members. Mr. Chairman, I would add the condition that um, I'm sorry I lost uh, the number. Is it eight? It would be number eight, and number three would then become number nine. That would limit the hours of operation so that no patrons be seated or admitted to the restaurant after 10 p.m. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Uh, one moment, Mr. Emery, do you approve the amendment? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, David. I would like to uh, request that a 9 be made 10 and in place of 9, a site <laughs> barrier on four sides of the roof exhaust stand for free field noise reduction. Could you repeat Could you that? say that slowly so Maureen and Leslie can write it down? A site barrier on four sides of the roof exhaust stand be installed for free field noise reduction. Mr. Emery, any That's objections? No. Mr. Nichols, any no. objections to your second? Uh, one quick comment. The, the quantity of uh, perennial is on the landscaping plan. It is. It's in the most left-hand column. <clears throat> Over on the other side of the sheet. It's, it's not on my side. Down here. The sheet number two. I'm on sheet, uh, yeah, two. Let me see. No, the square footage is, but not the numbers. The quantity is on the left-hand board. Oh, I'm sorry, up in the top. Yeah, this is for the shrubs and trees. Okay. okay. Now the motion made and seconded is open for discussion. Hearing no discussion. All those in favor of the motion, signify by raising your right hand. Four. All those opposed? Three. The motion is approved. You could do that in writing to the town planner, if you could, please. Thank you. And I would ask that the findings uh, include 
the specific findings as recommended by uh, Michael Hill in his uh, memo of October 19th on page 2. Thank you, Mr. McNichols. Could you repeat that, please? I'm yes. sorry. That's the findings include uh, page 2 of Mr. Hill's submission of October 19th. And we find the existing property is currently in a state of disrepair. Find that the uh, opponents uh, testified that the will adversely affect the value of the abutting properties, citing noise, odor, headlights, and increased traffic. And that weighing the evidence and the applicant's proposed buffering and ventilation plans, we specifically find the project will not create an adverse impact on abutting property values. I'd, I'd like to ask if the four members who voted in the affirmative agree with those findings. Uh, in polling those four members that are voted in the affirmative, Mr. McNichols? Uh, ju just, just so we're covered here, would that be adequate to support the vote that's just been made, or do we need to uh, redo the vote for lack of the proper term? Well, I guess what I'm suggesting is you do whatever, you know, that – the, the cleanest way to do this would have been to read the findings as part of the original motion. Mm -hmm. I believe if you um, agree that you want to amend the motion to add those findings, that would still be on the record. It would be clear enough that it would be added to the motion. Um, the other thing, I, I was appreciative that Mr. McNichol read the actual motion because it's written in the will or will not, and you have to choose which way to go. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes. I said will not. I would, I would agree. Yes. Mr. Emery, you've agreed to the amendment? Uh, as, I would as support as having the, that read okay. into the record. Should we take a vote on that amongst the four members that voted in the affirmative? Those four members that voted in the affirmative, if you could signify your support of Mr. McNichols' recommendation by raising your right hand. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Not, Mr. Emery. Not, not to raise the issue uh, publicly, but perhaps it's important to. Uh, there was a motion made, and, and uh, we had three people voting against the project, and I think I understand that there were concerns raised during the discussion phase of the presentation, but I'm not sure why three people voted against the project. So in future votes, I think it would be helpful that um, the discussion period during after a motion has been made is often one, except for a motion to table, is a, a, an opportunity for people who... Uh, unless I completely missed it, maybe I was uh, missed it in the previous discussions, but um, I didn't. I was surprised that we had three people voting against the problem. I'm not criticizing people who did vote against it. I'm just was, normally what happens when you make a motion, somebody says, "I'm not going to vote for this because I don't like, you know, I don't like cats in my neighborhood or something like that." This, this. No, I was at another function. I it was oh, I was here at the last regular meeting. I was at the workshop. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments from the board before we move on to the next item on the agenda? <clears throat> Those members of the public that waited for these two public hearings. Uh, I thank you for your patience. Those members of the public who are now leaving uh, the hall, if you could uh, exit to the back of the hall so that your comments aren't picked up by our telecommunications people in the back room. Under other business, the next item on the agenda is telecommunications zoning amendments requests by the town council to consider amendments to the zoning ordinance that regulate telecommunications facilities creation of a proposed tower overlay district amendment to the official zoning map and amendment to the comprehensive plan public hearing section 1910-3 amendments would you like me to read the introduction maureen or would you like to i'll read okay Town Council has forwarded to the Planning Board revisions to the zoning ordinance that address the 1996 Federal Telecommunications Act. Following a public hearing in December 1998, the Planning Board tabled consideration of amendments and the town hired a consultant to evaluate the potential 
of the transfer station to host a tower that would serve the town. The Planning Board has reviewed the consultant's report, revised the proposed amendments, and scheduled a public hearing for this evening. The zoning amendment should be reviewed in accordance with Section 19-10-3 amendments. We'll begin by summarizing the proposed amendments, and then we will open the public hearing. Now can I turn it over to you? Okay. Maureen will take that. Uh, as, as the Board is aware, in 1996, the Federal Government ad adopted the Federal Telecommunications Act. Um, there was discuss discussion prior to adoption of completely uh, prohibiting local review of telecommunication facilities. Um, in the end, what they have done is, is allowed uh, local review, but they have preempted certain areas from town review. So what we are trying to do this evening is to propose ordinance amendments in response to, um, uh, in other words, a federal mandate. Uh, the, the federal government has said that we cannot have regulations in our community that prohibit uh, individual carriers from serving uh, our residents and that we cannot have regulations that prohibit um, the availability of wireless telecommunication services to the residents of the community. Uh, therefore, what the, the town has done is to, to write regulations uh, which, with the goal of minimizing the construction of new telecommunication towers as much as possible. Uh, we've begun by looking at our comprehensive plan because, of course, the comprehensive plan and the zoning ordinance must be consistent with each other. This is the first subject we've found in our comprehensive plan that isn't really addressed. So there is uh, two pages of what we are calling proposed amendments to the comprehensive plan that talk about the town's uh, existing telecommunication facilities and what our policies would be for expansion of telecommunication facilities. Secondly, there is a package of amendments, the zoning amendments, which talk about regulation of uh, towers. Uh, we're regulating two different kinds of uh, services. The major drive for all of this is commercial wireless services, and we're proposing a, a multi-pronged uh, multi effort. Uh, the first is uh, that we are creating something called a tower overlay district. It's a brand new district that does not exist in the town at this time. And if you are located within this, if you have property located within this district, you can apply to the planning board to build a tower of up to 180 feet in height that can be used for commercial wireless services. If you do apply to build a tower of this height, you must comply with a series of brand new standards which are also included in the regulations before you this evening. Those standards look at things like buffering and um, lighting, tower height, and looking at the need for or the requirement for co-location, that is, demonstration that a new tower is needed and that there's no room on any existing towers to accommodate your facilities. Uh, the other end of this whole set of regulations looks at what we're calling stealth technology, which is encouraging uh, the use, the, the proliferation or the service of wireless services throughout the town by locating antennas in existing buildings so that they cannot be seen. And uh, the expectation is that we would try to serve as much of the town as possible with those types of stealth technology antennas. And consequently, those types of facilities require a building permit from the code officer rather than site plan review by the planning board for the large new town. <coughs> Uh, the other thing this ordinance does for the first time is regulate amateur wireless towers. We do have a few towers in the town right now which are located in neighborhoods, don't have a height limit. The proposal would limit amateur wireless towers to 50 feet. There's a setback requirement and that they can be, a, a, the whole idea is that if you wanted to put a tower and it's <coughs> up to 15 feet from the top of your building, you could, from your home, you could do it without a building permit, but as the antenna or the tower become higher, you would, you would gradually increase the amount of review that you would require. The third thing that you have before you this evening is the proposal to rezone two areas of town to this new tower overlay district. So that would be an amendment to the zoning map. The two areas that are proposed are, are uh, 351 Spurwink Ave, where there is an existing 180-foot tower. The second area proposed is the transfer station property at 472 Spurwink Ave, which is owned by the town. 
There is no tower on that property right now. However, the town has hired a consultant that looked at the ability of a tower on that site to serve the town. The uh, preliminary conclusions from that report are, one, that there is a site on the transfer station property that would be adequate for a tower, and, two, that that site would be uh, potentially able to serve most of the under or non-served areas of the town right now. Are there any questions? I only have a comment. Is how could you possibly memorize a 15-page memo and, and speak to it so concisely to the public? It's been a long time. <laughs> it's just a reflection of your natural abilities that I'm always impressed with. At this time, I will open the public hearing. Anyone who would like to comment on this matter, please come to the podium. Identify yourself by name and address, and make your comments known to the planning board. I'm prepared to close the public hearing if no one wishes to come forward. Public hearing is now closed. I'd like to make a motion. Steve? Motion for the board to consider, be it ordered that based on the materials and the facts presented, the telecommunications zoning amendments be recommended to the town council for adoption. Second. Thank you, Nancy. A motion has been made and seconded. Is there further discussion on behalf of board members? Mr. Emery. Mr. Chairman, uh, just a point of clarification on the proposed uh, overlay district map. Um, just so everyone who's sitting here is aware, we're also indicating that the land leased by the Portland Water District is also uh, part of the overlay district. It's thus shown on the map. Which map are you using, Tom? I'm using uh, 472 Spurwink Avenue. I'm talking about the uh, sewage, uh, not the brick building on the uh, west side of Spurwink, but the uh, pump station site on the yes. east side. Yes. You're right. That is included. Just to clarify, this is a, a piece of property that is uh, leased to the water district from the town, and it's located on Spurwink Ave, and it's part of the transfer station lot. It's not any other piece of Portland Water District property. Further discussion from board members? If there is no further discussion, I will call for a vote on the matter. Nancy? No. Oh, you're just getting ready? Voting. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Thank you. The motion carries. Next item on the agenda. The Variance Standards Zoning Amendments, request by the Zoning Board to consider amendments to the Zoning Ordinance that replace the undue hardship criteria with the practical difficulty criteria and setback reductions for non-conforming lots. Public Hearing Section 19-10-3 Amendments. The Zoning Board has requested that the Planning Board recommend that the undue hardship variance standard be replaced with the practical difficulty variance standard. In reviewing this request, the Planning Board reviewed the characteristics of variances over the last three years and is also recommending that the setback requirements for non-conforming lots be reduced. Public hearing has been scheduled for this evening. Attached are the proposed amendments, which will be reviewed for compliance with Section 19-10-3 amendments. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Wilcox. Uh, it would be appropriate if I recused myself from discussion of this item. Very well. <laughs> Shall I leave the podium? I don't think it's necessary. Okay, I'll just kind of sit back a little bit. And, just be and walk, quiet. And watch and enjoy. And enjoy. <laughs> I 
I'll begin this one by opening the public hearing. Public hearing under varying standards revisions to the zoning ordinance is now open. Those requesting to be heard by the planning board come forward and identify yourself by name and address, please. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the planning board. My name is Henry Warren, and I'm chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, the Zoning Board has uh, discussed this issue a number of times over months and as, as you remember at a workshop meeting with the Planning Board to try to explain our concerns and uh, very much supports the proposals in front of you. However, some of my comments that will be just personal, I can't tell you how each of the board members arrived at their particular uh, individual concern. Uh, but just to convey that uh, the board as a whole is certainly very much in support of the uh, proposal which came from all these discussions and from the efforts of the code enforcement officer and uh, your planner. Uh, my concern, and I think some of that of some of the other board members, comes from a building frustration over a period of almost three years on the board. Uh, because we are asked in many ways to balance a strict interpretation of the ordinance uh, against what I feel anyway is a realistic view of the appropriate property use in our community. And those two uh, uh, competing claims on the uh, attention and decisions of the Zoning Board of Appeals do not sometimes uh, lead to simple or easy or even, in many cases, in my opinion, appropriate uh, results. Uh, the Cape has many areas with older homes and smaller sized lots, non-conforming lots. And we also have the kind of town that pe uh, people seem to want to stay in. And oftentimes the ordinance uh, forces us into a position of driving people away from their homes when their personal needs such as an increase in family size or even a simple desire to have a garage uh, conflicts with the uh, strict interpretation of the variance requirements of the ordinance. Uh, given the hour, I'm just going to skip through this briefly, but I found it instructive. I believe it was Mr. McNichols that unearthed the uh, uh, recent Supreme Court decision in the case of Edward Rowe versus the city of South Portland. And uh, I find that opinion, and I believe, the, I hope the board members of the planning board found it instructive, uh, just in an educational way, if in no other way, <clears throat> because I think it clarifies, or at least puts in simple terms, the issues that we're talking about here. As the uh, Supreme Court makes very clear and, and, and consistent with our own variance, it requires that the board find, the Zoning Board of Appeals find, that there is undue hardship. Undue hardship means that property cannot yield a reasonable return without the variance that's being requested. And a reasonable return means, it <coughs> means quote, the practical loss of all beneficial use of the land. And my experience, at least, and I think that of most people would be that very few situations arise in which the practical loss of all beneficial use of the land is the result of the denial of a variance thereby leaving the board with the dilemma that I mentioned earlier, that is uh, slipping away from the strict interpretation of the ordinance, which our town attorney finds very distasteful, uh, or in effect denying uh, people the right to make changes to their property which accommodates their family needs and which in most, if not all other ways, would be of little impact on the neighbors or on the uh, neighborhood in general if they're living in. Uh, the state legislature recognized this problem some years back and came up with the practical difficulty standard which you're addressing and has offered the option to municipalities to adopt that standard uh, and that's what you're proposing tonight. I hope that you will. It's a good, it's a good solution along with the additional proposal to recognize that in non-conforming lots there should be a slightly smaller setback requirement. First of all, it recognizes that there are parts of town where uh, these non-conforming lots create very tight situations and that the setbacks perhaps should be adjusted to reflect that. That in itself would reduce, I think, uh, to some degree, the number of situations which even require a variance and uh, make it much easier for people to accommodate their needs. 
uh, the practical difficulty standard uh, key issues that the board would be faced in making a decision. There are a number, but the two most prominent ones from my point of view are that the proposed change will not detrimentally affect the use or market value of abutting properties and that there is no feasible alternative to a variance available. That's a very different uh, standard for the board to work with than the undue hardship issue, which, uh, as I pointed out, leads to the whole question of, of no practical uh, use for the property. Uh, so we hope that you will be comfortable in recommending this uh, change to the uh, town council, and they in turn will adopt them, not for the comfort of the comfort of the zoning board, although that would certainly help, but because I at least think, and I believe the board members support this, <clears throat> that this change would be consistent with uh, both maintaining the quality of the town at the same time uh, providing additional opportunities uh, for people to stay here uh, in property situations which are uh, currently uh, far too confining for their changing family needs. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them with no guarantees. Any questions of the speaker? On behalf of the planning board, I thank the zoning board for working with us in the workshops to bring this matter to a conclusion. Thank you. Further comments from the public? Good evening. My name is Jeffrey Stevenson. I live at number 8 Hampton Road. Uh, some of the words I just heard are, I, I praise the previous speaker, reality, practicality, consistency, and flexibility. Um, those are the things that Zoning Board of Appeals does not have right now. Um, I'm obviously in favor of the changes. The current situation with respect to the setbacks and the, uh, and the um, undue hardship is really intolerable. Um, every house in my neighborhood uh, is in some way non-conforming. Nobody has a two-acre lot. Nobody has a correct street setback. That's because uh, if the neighborhood was rezoned after it was built. If you took a tour, you'd find many non-conforming structures in my neighborhood. It's a diver diverse neighborhood with a mix of colonials, garrisons, gambrels, split levels, and ranches. Talking Hampton Road, Jewett Road, Fenway, if you go through that area. The town has dealt with the divergence of zoning and reality by, up till recently, allowing reality to win at the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, the current required setbacks are too strict for my neighborhood. Thus, neighbors of mine have received in the past variances for reduced setbacks to build family rooms, and you'll find garages less than 25 feet from the sidelines. Every house, as I said, is closer to the street right of way than required. My wife and I recently made an appeal for a side setback reduction to build a garage. Uh, we were asking for what we felt was a reasonable reduction, much like my neighbors, much like you would find existing already in the neighborhood. Uh, if allowed, I believe my, garage would, my proposed garage would have fit hand in glove. Yet, uh, we had to come before uh, a different board than my neighbors, so one with uh, new urgency to enforce the law strictly as written. Uh, we, I accept that the board has interpreted the law with due diligence, without any malice, and that they're trying to do their job. Thus, we need to change the law. It's just impractical. We can't have a system where citizens have to check in with which way the wind is blowing at town boards before making an appeal. And we can't have one set of citizens waved ahead under the rules while others in the same situation are refused under those same rules at a different time. My neighbors have had the benefit of uh, looser or reality-based interpretations of the um, zoning rules. I would like to have the same freedom with my property. Uh, it's time to recognize the, the reality of the neighborhoods. It's time to put in place these practical changes that reflect that reality. And I believe that if you make these, uh, if you adopt these, these standards, you will have a major step toward fairness. Uh, I know that if the <coughs> standards were in place, I would not have had to come before the Zoning Board of Appeals. 
I was asking in my case for a 10 foot reduction in the side setback to build a garage. And uh, because of the nature of my lot, I faced a situation where the only place I could legally put it would be either be behind the house or right up against the south end of my house. I have a Gambrel windows on the south and the north. I would lose all my windows on the south. Uh, a lot of uh, Hobson's choice, if you will. So I encourage you to please put this forward as quickly as possible. Uh, I believe that they reflect the reality of my neighborhood and uh, would give the flexibility and, and reduce certainly the volume of appeals that would come before the town. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments from the public? Please come forward. Hi, I'm Jennifer Libby, and I live at 21 Lawson Road, and I basically don't have anything more to offer except that I would urge you to adopt the proposal. Uh, my neighborhood is also nonconforming. Uh, we have the challenges of uh, septic tanks and leach fields and roads that really aren't there, that are, um, that you really can't tell where they begin and where they end. Um, I, too, would like to put a garage. I have a one-car garage. I have one bathroom and a four-bedroom house. As it stands right now, I can't do anything, and my family is growing, and uh, it would help. I know a lot of other neighbors as well if we could have a little bit more freedom to work uh, within the <coughs> confines of our homes. I don't want to leave my home, but I need more room, and I need a garage, and... Um, with all the restrictions, that makes it very difficult. So I would urge you to adopt this proposal. Thanks. Thank you. Further comments? Hearing none, I'm prepared to close the public hearing. The public hearing is now closed. <coughs> It's open for board discussion. Yes, Steve. One question. Certainly. Um, under powers and duties, section 19-5-2, uh, number, new number three, do we actually have to have the wording in there or a prior owner? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Do we have to have the wording in there that the, okay, it reads, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. And that's, I think the wording that I have seen before was the, like the immediate prior owner or something along those lines. But does that even need to be there? Change the A to the. Or just limited. drop or a prior owner. I mean, or the, the prior owner. I mean, it's not limited. the present owner's fault what someone else did. And if we're relaxing these standards to such a degree, I don't think it really, there's not going to be a conspiracy of owners to try to finagle something. <laughs> I, I don't agree with that. I, uh, there, there are conspiracies out there in terms